I'm not sure who the prize would be for, but yes, I think it, they're probably yes. um, And then there should be an authority, the authorities bundle should have been supplemented with two additional authorities. I'm in the last couple of days, El Masri and Bel Hodge. Uh, yes. And with that, I think the housekeeping ends. Good. My Lord, before I begin my submissions, I should say that to begin with, at least, I'll be referring to the judgment below. And that begins at uh, page 97 of the core. Yes. My Lord, the issue in this appeal is what obligations... Um, and the scope of the obligations which the respondent owes to British citizens who are detained by a foreign government abroad. As my Lords will have seen from the judgment below, the stakes could hardly be higher than they are in this case. Two years ago, on 19th of June 2021, the appellant's brother, Namdi Kanu, was the victim of an extraordinary rendition. Mr. Carnu is a British citizen and he was traveling on a British passport. He is also the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra. He was abducted while he was in Kenya by the Nigerian security forces, held incommunicado in a secret location and ill-treated over several days. Then, on around the 27th of 2021, without any access to due process or a court of law, he was forcibly removed across the border on a secret flight to Nigeria. Once there, he was detained and charged with criminal offences which carry the death penalty. My Lords, as the judge records, and this is paid paragraphs four to five of the judgment, these are not just allegations of ill treatment and extraordinary rendition. They are the findings of two Nigerian courts, including the Nigerian Court of Appeal. Um, from the 13th of October 2022, that's the Court of Appeal, and the 26th of October 2022. And my Lords, I don't propose to go to those judgments, but I'm going to give you the references, which is what, uh, that is what paragraphs four and five of the judgment uh, below are drawn from. The 13th of October 2022 judgment is at Supplementary Bundle 298 to 386. And the 26th of October, judgment is at Supplementary Bundle 212 to 251. Mr. Carnu has, in the two years since his extraordinary rendition, been in the custody of the Nigerian Department of State Services, which I will call DSS, where he is being held in long-term solitary confinement in conditions which threaten his precarious health. And that, um, my lords, is at um, paragraph six of the judgment. He is there and remains there, notwithstanding his success in the Nigerian Court of Appeal in October 22, in, Octo in overturning the criminal charges against him. That should have led to his release. But the Nigerian government has appealed the dismissal of those criminal charges to the Supreme Court and has obtained a stay in the meantime. But it's important in my submission that the grounds of appeal do not on their face dispute the findings of extraordinary rendition. They argue instead that the court was wrong to find that that extraordinary rendition deprived the criminal court of jurisdiction to hear the criminal charges. And those grounds of appeal are in the supplementary bundle at pages 185 to 18192. Just to give a flavour of the sorts of arguments that are being run in the Supreme Court, one of the grounds of appeal, which is at supplementary bundle 188, says that the essence of criminal jurisdiction arising from abduction of a person from a foreign jurisdiction has been, and I'm quoting this, male captus bene detentus, translated as wrongly captured or pro and properly detained. So that, that is the basis on which the appeal has been mounted, that the 
uh, criminal court retains jurisdiction, notwithstanding the findings of extraordinary rendition. Now, that appeal still hasn't been heard, uh, neither has um, Mr Carnu's application for bail. It's currently listed for the 14th of September, having been adjourned from a prior hearing date of May 2023. And in the meantime, Mr Carnu remains in solitary confinement in detention. Now, as the judge also recognises in his judgment at paragraph three, the extraordinary rendition is not the first time that the Nigerian government have sought to harm Mr Carney. Four years earlier, in September 2017, while on bail for criminal charges, Mr Carney was forced to flee Nigeria in fear of his life after the Nigerian military launched a violent raid on his house in which they attempted to kill him. Now, that attempt on his life is also a finding of the Nigerian court from January 2022. That uh, judgment is in Supplementary Bundle 261 to 282. Now, together, all of this means that the Nigerian government planned and executed Mr Kanu's abduction in June 2021 in circumstances where they must have known that his lawful extradition uh, could never have been achieved because of the risk posed to his life. Now, in all these circumstances, the appellant, Mr Kanu's brother, has since July 2021 sought urgent <coughs> assistance from the respondent to obtain Mr Kanu's release, to protect him from harm while in custody, and to seek accountability for his rendition and ill treatment. My Lords, there's no dispute that the appellant has a legitimate expectation that the respondent will consider those requests. That expectation was identified in the Court of Appeals judgment in Abassi, and I will come later to examine that judgment in detail. Nor is there a dispute that the respondent has considered the risk requests and taken a range of steps in consequence. And those steps are set out in the judgment below at paragraphs 9, 11, and 22 to 24. Thus, um, the respondent has intervened on Mr Carney's behalf, raising the allegations about his unlawful transfer and his concerns about his ill treatment with the respondent's Nigerian counterparts on a series of occasions. He has sought responses to those allegations and he has also sought reassurance about um, Mr Carney's conditions of detention. But the respondent has refused to go further, even though he accepts it is open to him to do so. He has not acknowledged publicly that Mr Carney is a victim of extraordinary rendition. He has not made representations to this effect to the Nigerian government privately, and he has not called for Mr Carney's release. He has also not taken steps to impose sanctions on anyone responsible. Now, my Lords, he's explained the approach that he's taken in three disclosed ministerial submissions from the 6th of July 2021, the 6th of September 2021, and most recently at, on the 10th of August 2022. Those ministerial submissions, which I will uh, turn, come back to, are in the supplementary bundle at pages 130 to 144. He's also explained his approach in the evidence of Ms. Sarah Broughton, which is in the supplementary bundle at page 51. And again, I will come back to that. So what is the appellant's uh, case in this appeal and the claim below? Although the appellant wishes that the respondent would take these steps, as the judge recognises, and you can see this from the judgment at paragraph 17 and also paragraph 26. It is not his claim, 
and is, he does not seek by his claim to require the respondent to take those steps. It is the appellant's case instead that in order to take a properly considered decision as to what steps to take, the respondent must first reach a clear internal view as to whether Mr. Carno has been the victim of an extraordinary rendition. The appellant says that clarity on this prior question is an essential component of a lawful decision-making process and essential to meet his and Mr. Carno's legitimate expectations. But the respondent has instead, starting on the 30th of June 2021, the day after Mr. Kanu was charged in a Nigerian court, maintained only a provisional view as to the legality of Mr. Kanu's transfer and detention. And my lords, can I now ask you to turn up Ms. Broughton's statement in the supplementary bundle uh, at page 68? begins at page 51 and at, at page 68 is a paragraph 45b which lists which is part of a list uh, of updates on new information that were given to ministers and you'll see at b that on the 30th of june 2021 the respondents' officials updated Minister Dudridge, the Foreign Secretary and Minister Adams, setting out the steps that were being taken in Mr. Carnu's case and containing an FCDO's officials' provisional view as to the likelihood that Mr. Carnu's transfer constituted extraordinary rendition and his arrest and detention violating international human rights laws and as to the involvement of Kenya. And the same point is made at uh, page, paragraph 47E on page 72 on the 8th of July. A briefing note was given to uh, uh, the respondents' officials who were meeting with the Nigerian foreign minister containing, you'll see at the end of that, paragraph, subparagraph, an official's provisional view as to the legality of Mr. Kanu's transfer, detention, and the likelihood of trial. My lords, that provisional view, or that view that he has taken, has remained provisional or preliminary ever since. And it remains so to date, notwithstanding the developments in the evidence and the passage of time. And we can see that from the following letters and um, other documents. So the letter, uh, the respondent's letter of the 14th of April 2022, which is under challenge, one of the decisions under challenge in these proceedings, is at 435 to 437 of the bundle. that was written in response to a request on the 23rd of March 2022 you can see this from paragraph 20 uh, sorry from paragraph 1 a request from the appellant to acknowledge that Mr Carno had been subject to extraordinary rendition and you can see at paragraph 3 the FCDO does not consider it would be appropriate to confirm unequivocally that Kenya or Nigeria's conduct was in breach of international law. Instead, the FCDO considers the appropriate response is to continue to raise the circumstances of Mr. Kanu's arrest with both governments. And similarly, at, um, on the, in the letter of 9th of June 2022, this is a response to the pre-action protocol letter, at 457 to 
paragraph four. Previous correspondence has set out the considerable diplomatic efforts which are being made, including at the highest levels, to provide Mr. Carney with consulate assistance and to make representations on his behalf. In deciding to take these steps, the Secretary of State has necessarily formed a provisional view on the information available to her as, whether, as to whether the allegations are credible and as to whether they either do or may constitute a violation of international law. The Secretary of State is not prepared to share this view, not prepared to share, share this view and does not consider it appropriate to do so. And then again, at, at paragraph 17, the Secretary of State has considered what steps would most assist Mr. Kano with regard to her provisional view. This is a page 459 as to the legality and gravity of Mr. Kano's treatment, as well as the representations submitted by your client alongside advice from the FCDO. And in Ms. Broughton's witness statement, turning back um, to that in the supplementary bundle of 16. I'm sorry, the supplementary bundle at um, 65. This statement you'll see at the end, which is at page 76, is dated the 4th of October 2022. You'll see, so uh, uh, paragraph 39, when considering what further steps are necessary, the FCDO will often, as it has done in this case, reach a preliminary view as to the credibility of the allegations based on the material available. In conducting this assessment, the weight that is accorded to various pieces of evidence varies depending on the circumstances of the individual case. My Lord, Rather than me read this out, could I ask you, because these paragraphs are going to be important, to read paragraphs 39 to 42? Yes. Or 43, in fact. So, my lords, you'll see that on the basis of that preliminary view, um, the decision has been taken as to whether to make a public statement and, and that a number of other factors have also been taken into account. Um, and then at 42, um, Ms. Broughton has explained that forming a concluded view in the face of evolving evidence would not be appropriate uh, and that reaching or publishing a concluded view would not change uh, our objectives or how we've approached the case. And at 43, um, she cannot foresee what new evidence will come to light. And then if I could ask you at 44C, which is at 60, to look at 44C. You'll see that the submission that was made, the ministerial submission, was made on the 10th of August. Consider the, the option of calling for Mr. Carney's release. Um, in the middle of that paragraph, the government's policy was that calls for release should be a last resort in exceptional circumstances. And at the end of that paragraph, the submission also contained provisional and legally privileged advice, so we, we can't see it, um, as to the, Mr. Carney's allegations of arbitrary detention. So that was Ms. Browser's position on the 4th of October 2022. 
um, my lords, it hasn't changed in the light of um, the uh, judgments of the Nigerian Court of Appeal and High Court. And you can see that from the recent correspondence, um, which is um, at, at an exchange at supplementary bundle 473 and 475. And at 473, you'll see a letter from the appellant's solicitors, Spineman's, asking towards the end of that letter, what we're referring to is a, a paragraph of Mr. Justice Swift's judgment, which stated, paragraph 29, no doubt the Secretary of State's approach will now also be informed by the conclusions set out in the judgments of the Court of Appeal in Nigeria given on 13th of October, post-dating the evidence filed in these proceedings. I've seen reference in correspondence to a note for Val sent on the 24th of October 22, presumably sent in the light of those conclusions. Um, and the letter at the bottom of the page says, at last, please confirm that it remains the Secretary of State's position that the internal view on what has happened to Mr. Carno even now remains provisional because of the evolving evidence and the constant inflow of new information. It's referring back to Ms. Broughton's statement that she seen and the re reply comes at page 475 yes paragraph three the nigerian government is uh, our client is aware of the decision the nigerian government is currently appealing the judgment of the appeal court to the supreme court as such the nature of this case continues to evolve and our client will assure he need, remains apprised of any new information that is the response to that question and it must therefore continue to be the case that a provisional view has been taken and indeed um, that is the position recorded in the Secretary of State's skeleton argument a couple of weeks later on the 30th of May 2023. You can see this in the core bundle. Well, just before leaving, can I just invite you to cast an eye down the rest of that letter so you can see what action has been taken in the light of those developments? Yes, thank you. Don't need the details so you get the sense of it. Just since you have been asked to look at it at 4A, you'll see um, that a, some further note for bowels were sent to the Nigerian government, including one on the 19th of December 2022 and a further one on the 2nd of May 2023, the 475. And there was, for the first time, as we understand it, a response to those, one of those note for bowels from the government of Nigeria. We haven't had any information from the respondent about what that response contained, and there's been no disclosure of either the note for Val or the request. Um, my Lord, so the, the skeleton argument is at Court Bundle 57. characterizes the appellant's appeal as being sexual state is obliged in public law to intervene in a particular way by reaching an effective final view on the allegations. Secretary of State has declined to take that course. He has confirmed that he has considered these those allegations and has formed a provisional view as to their credibility on and what and on whether whether they may constitute a, a violation of international law but has declined to share that view. So, my lords, the position remains that the Secretary of State's um, stance on whether Mr. Kanu has been the victim of an extraordinary rendition is provisional. And it, that means that all the decisions on what steps to be 
to take have been taken on this uncertain, provisional or preliminary basis. And it is the appellant's case in this appeal that that starting point is unlawful for three reasons. It's a breach of his legitimate expectation, that's ground one, based on Abbasi and the requirement that's set out there in a number of paragraphs, paragraphs 92, 99 um, and, and 99, and I'll come back to them, um, to at least start from a formulated view as to whether there has been a, a breach of, of rights and as to the gravity of the resulting denial of rights. That's ground one. This is all in the appellant's skeleton argument, which starts at page 71 of the core bundle. Ground two is it's irrational due to the overwhelming evidence of extraordinary rendition and the fact that there is no prospect of that evidential position changing. And ground three is that the respondent has acted unfairly in either, in not either informing the appellant of what the provisional view is or of the factors which would cause it to shift. My Lords, the judge rejected all these arguments. Um, he rejected the argument that the court in Abassi had said there was a need to start from a concluded view, saying there was no such first step. That's <coughs> paragraph 28 of the judgment, which is at Core Bundle 113. He said, as my Lords will have seen, that in practice what is required is that the respondent is sufficiently informed, which is akin to the standard in the House of Lords judgment in Thameside, requiring the respondent to take reasonable steps to acquaint himself with relevant information. That's judgment, paragraph 28. He also said that the respondent's refusal of the request to reach a concluded view quote, does no more than reflect the Secretary of State's opinion, this is judgment paragraph 29, <coughs> on how best to conduct his affairs with the Nigerian authorities to give the greatest chance of providing practical assistance to Mr. Kanu, and that it's part of the conduct of international relations. He also rejected the argument that it was irrational for the respondent to maintain his provisional view again holding that the refusal to state the view reflects the respondent's opinion on what steps should be taken best to assist him and is part and parcel of the respondent's assessment of how to conduct foreign relations. And he says at paragraph 32 of the judgment um, that the distinction which the appellant has drawn between reaching a view privately and stating it publicly is artificial. That's in the judgment at paragraph 32. And finally, he has found that there is no requirement for the respondent to act fairly, stating at, paragraph, at judgment paragraph 35 that the respondent is not exercising a power that attracts an obligation of procedural fairness. And my lords, the appellant appeals with permission against each of these conclusions. In short, it's my submission that they're inconsistent with both the law and the evidence. But before I come to those grounds of appeal, which I will take in turn, I want to address why reaching a clear or concluded view matters in this case. Why does it matter to the appellant? And the question arises because if, as the appellant accepts, the respondent may be entitled to keep any concluded or clear view he reaches private. He may be entitled to do that in the exercise of, dis of his discretion. And if, as the appellant accepts, subject to any uh, uh, lawfulness, he may decide, so subject to acting lawfully, he may decide not to take any different steps. Why does it matter whether this private view is provisional or not? And my Lords, the simple answer to that question is that reaching a clear view as to whether Mr. Kanu was the victim of an extraordinary rendition could make a difference to the steps taken. It is a, thus a logical first step in the decision-making process. Right. 
understand because I sense that it's important. Why does why does reaching a clear concluded view matter? Answer because because reaching a clear view as to whether Mr. Carney was a victim of extraordinary rendition could make a difference to the steps taken. It is thus a logical first step. On the other hand, the respondent's position, which is maintaining a provisional view because he has already decided not to take the additional steps that are sought by the appellant, is back to front reasoning. It approaches the decision-making process the wrong way round. It says, what would I do? And therefore, is it necessary for me to reach a concluded view privately, as opposed to, has he been the victim of an extraordinary rendition? Yes or no, therefore, what should I do? That is the obvious, in my submission, logical and correct way to approach the decision-making process. So what difference could it make if the Secretary of State reached a concluded view? It provides, in short, the justification for him to take a series of escalated steps to assist a British citizen detained abroad. My Lord, the approach that the Secretary of State takes, the respondent takes, when a, a British citizen is detained abroad is set out in the prisoner policy guidance, which is in the supplementary bundle. Um, the, the paragraph I want to, uh, the page I want to, part I want to look at is at page 79. See, it starts at 78. First of all, the distinction that is drawn between intervention and interference. And what is said is that the UK government can intervene on behalf of a British national under certain circumstances. This is usually where we have concerns for the health, welfare or human rights of British nationals or have concerns that they are being unlawfully or unjustifiably discriminated against. And this is what we can consider intervention. And a list of possible grounds for intervention is set out below. Health and welfare concerns, uh, torture or mistreatment, death penalty, and so on and so forth we cannot consider interference. Intervention must be appropriate, this is at the bottom of the page, and justified. Under international law, we cannot interfere in the interna internal affairs of another state, including their judicial proceedings. The UK's eternal, uh, internal affairs are similarly protected from foreign yeah. interference. And then there is a list of, of matters that are likely to be considered interference. Um, expressing an opinion, this is over the page 80, expressing an opinion on the guilt or innocence of the accused, seeking to influence the court's judgment on a case. And, um, and other examples are given. So, um, my lords, there is always a, 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 um, an imperative to avoid interference, um, and to, but there is a need, nonetheless, to intervene where there are concerns. But, um, and you can see how this works in Ms. Broughton's witness statement at paragraph three, which is um, just before this in the bundle at page 54. Sorry, page 52. Thank you.
negotiations with the respondent, uh, sorry, with the uh, Nigerian authorities. And you can also see in the way that she uh, describes the policy at pages, at uh, paragraphs 8 onwards at 53, <coughs> at this distinction between intervention and interference. And the, what, what is happening at paragraph 14, when you send a note for bowels, we may signal, this is at page 55, we may signal to local authorities we have an interest in the case by sending a note for bow. We may ask questions, this is at paragraph 14. Often, she's, uh, uh, this is from the PPG, the Pr Prison Policy Guidance, asking questions can act as a prompt for concerns to be addressed, or the, answer, or the answers may act as the basis for further intervention. And she goes on to describe the purpose of uh, uh, the, how lobbying may assist. And what is clear from all of these steps is that forming a concluded view as to whether there's been a violation of international law is not essential to intervention of that type. Expression of concerns, raising allegations or seeking assurances that a British national will receive a fair trial. These types of steps can be taken on the basis of preliminary views and on the basis of the allegations that are made. But my lords, those steps have already been taken over the last two years in Mr. Kanu's case. And you can see that, um, and Ms. Broughton has explained that, she, that the allegations, this is a paragraph two, have been taken most seriously and repeatedly raised in formal communications. The latest letter that my learned friend uh, asked you to read further into, so again, sets out all those types of communications. But what is important is that justified intervention is not limited to those raising those kind of concerns or allegations or asking for further <coughs> information. It can include more robust steps and at this point, I would like to ask you to look at the ministerial submission of the 10th of August 2022, which is at page 141 of the bundle. The supplementary bundle, I should say. And this ministerial submission, which starts at 140, was in response to it a request from those instructing me that uh, the respondent take further steps in relation to the fact that Mr. Kano had been the victim of extraordinary rendition uh, and ask for his, both acknowledging that fact and asking for his release. And you can see, if I could ask you then to read um, paragraphs eight to 10 of this ministerial submission.
Yes, how, how far did you want us to go? Uh, just to the end of 10. Right. Um, in the first instance, I'm going to ask you to look over the page. But um, So you'll see at paragraph 9 <coughs> that ministers <coughs> retain the discretion to depart from policy and call for release in exceptional circumstances, provided there's a rational basis for doing so. The principal exceptional circumstance um, uh, where ministers have previously called for release, so it has been done, is where the FCDO has credible evidence to suggest the detainee is arbitrarily detained, although to date that has only been done in very limited circumstances. So um, you can see there that it is possible to call for release where there is credible evidence to suggest the detainee is arbitrarily detained. And realistically, given how exceptional that is, it's not going to happen unless there is a clear, unless a clear and concluded view has been taken that the individual uh, has been the victim of an extraordinary rendition. That option remains available there. And you can see over the page why it is not recommended. What is recommended is continuing lobbying because calling for release is exceptional. We see this in paragraph 11. Uh, human rights violations cannot be, uh, it needs to be done where human rights violations cannot be remedied by other means, where we judge that call for release is a credible and effective step. We assess there are still further steps can be taken before consideration of this, this exceptional measure. Lobbying and escalation, you'll see, and at the end of that paragraph, monitoring ongoing legal proceedings in Kenya and Nigeria where the allegations are being considered. Um, and you can then see at paragraph 13, the option is not recommended. We do not, um, uh, the, to call for release, we do not <coughs> assess lobbying has been exhausted, nor that all legal remedies have been exhausted. Nor is it clear that a call for release would be credible or effective. The civil proceedings in Kenya and Nigeria remain ongoing. And then it says here, there will therefore be opportunities for the courts in Kenya and Nigeria to consider the allegations and potentially provide remedy to the alleged rights violations. Um, British High Commissioner Abuja and, and Nairobi can also further escalate lobbying on the allegations to try and obtain a response from both governments. And then there is a concern <coughs> that calling for release at this stage before it's a measure of last resort could set an unmanageable precedent. And the, the submission then goes on to say that it would be effective um, at paragraphs 14 onwards. Um, so, my lords, um, calling for release in exceptional circumstances is available. And you can see from Miss Broughton's witness statement, I won't ask you to turn it up again. But it's sorry, okay. to, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Who or what is post? Uh, I, I, I think it, that's the, the commission in the British High Commission. As I understand it. Thank you. Um, and so without turning it up again, Miss Broughton's witness statement at page 63 of the supplementary bundle at 36A, um, accordingly says, it's extremely rare to definitively state that treatment is illegal in international law. This is it publicly. Uh, but it's rare, but it is possible. And she repeats, referring back to this same policy in the ministerial submission of paragraph 36E, this is page 64 of the supplementary bundle, is that government policy is that no representations for release of British nationals detained abroad are made other than in exceptional circumstances and usually as a matter of last resort. So, my lords, the fact that this is not merely a theoretical option, however rare, is made clear from a series of examples that are given in Ms. Shirin Marker's second statement in the supplementary bundle at pages 145 to 151, at paragraphs 8 to 27. And you'll see that in those examples that she gives, uh, the respondent has, on several occasions, made public statements concerning the legality of an individual's detention by a foreign government <coughs> and 
has also called for their release. Those um, examples date from a series um, over the decades, from 1984 onwards, including in relation to the United States, rendition flights at paragraph 12, Paragraph 16, the treatment of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. <coughs> and at paragraphs um, 22, the uh, requests by um, then Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab, February 2021, for the immediate and permanent release of all arbitrarily detained dual British nationals in Iran and the requests for release in Iran by then Foreign Secretary Liz Truss on the 1st of October 2021, British national Murad Tabaz, unjustly detained in Iran, <coughs> paragraph 24, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, appalling continuation, decision to proceed with these baseless charges, appalling, appalling continuation of the cruel ordeal that she is going through. And there are other examples given there as well, including a paragraph 26 by the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, acknowledging that the Indian government was arbitrarily detaining Jagtar Singh Jahal. So it can be done. Uh, but obviously, unnecessarily, when it is done, a conclusion is going to have to be reached that someone has been arbitrarily detained. But that is not the only difference that um, a concluded view could make. It could also make a difference to the decision as to whether to impose sanctions on an individual to designate a person or sanctions. And that is dealt with in Ms. Chirin Marker's second statement um, at paragraph 28 onwards, um, at page um, 151. And she refers there to the global Human Rights Sanctions Regulations 2020, which is in the Authorities Bundle tab 20 at page 645. If I could just briefly turn that up. contained in this instrument are to deter and provide accountability for activities falling within paragraph two. An activity falls within this paragraph if it's an activity which, if carried out by or on behalf of a state within that territory, within the territory of that state would amount to a serious violation by that state of an individual's right to life, right not to be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, or right to be free from, free from slavery, not to be held in servitude, or required to perform forced or compulsory labour. And just um, uh, to be clear, extraordinary rendition includes within its definition uh, arbitrary uh, detention and transfer um, in the absence of lawful process for the purposes of um, ill treatment or um, um, uh, uh, interrogation under torture. So that is part of the definition. And I can give you that. That's what the authorities of El and Bell Hodge make the claim. Um, so, um, and then at, at Regulation 6, the criteria for designating a person. The Secretary of State may not designate a person under Regulation 5 unless the Secretary of State has reasonable grounds to suspect that, that person is an involved person. And an involved person, without going through the full definition, is involved in one of these activities. Now, reasonable grounds to suspect is a a relatively low test, but that doesn't mean that the Secretary of State is realistically going to impose sanctions or designate a person where she has only, he has only reached a provisional view that the activity has taken place. And if that wasn't obvious, yeah, it is made obvious by the guidance at um, tab 21, 
the designation guidance, tab 21 of the authorities bundle. And you'll see um, that the factors that the government will have regard to. The following factors are likely to be relevant, but this list is not exhaustive. This is at page 674. the seriousness of the conduct. Her Majesty's Government is likely to consider the scale, impact and nature of both of the human rights violation or abuse and of public involvement in that violation or abuse, including whether the conduct has a systematic nature or is part of a pattern of behaviour. So again, realistically, it is inconceivable that the Secretary of State would uh, designate somebody for sanctions in circumstances where she hasn't even formed a concluded view herself as to whether the underlying activity that they are said to be that they're said, there is said to be a reasonable suspicion that they're involved in constitutes a breach of international law such as an extraordinary rendition so that's um, the position in relation to sanctions and we can see the Respondent's own approach to that in the ministerial submission of 6th of September 2021, uh, which is in the supplementary bundle at 139. This is her approach to it in this case. And I should say um, that make clear that the first two ministerial submissions include, and that's, this is the 2nd of July 2021 and September 2021, um, were made before the respondent had gained access to Mr. Carno in detention. So they, they were made before any clear information had um, emerged. So this is 139, the start of the submission is at 134, and at the back there is an annex of options, there are recommendations as to what course to take, and then there is an, an annex of alternative options which were not recommended. And you can see um, at 139 the sanctions option. If I could just ask you to read that rather than reading it out. was looking for evidence to substantiate the allegations um, before considering um, uh, uh, imposing or before deciding to impose sanctions not clear whether the case meets the evidential thresholds so that's that's sanctions diplomatic protection is, a, is another option that is available and that's described in the prisoner policy guidance at um, page 104 of the bundle. I don't know much about this, Ms. Kilroy, but can you do that where the individual is a dual citizen? It is, it is, yes, you can. It's, I mean, there, there will be, there may be a dispute with the uh, member state, the, oh, sorry, sorry, the other, the other state as to whether they will accept um, that dual protection is being exercise, but it is possible on the respondent's uh, approach to its lines. And that, that was done, in fact, in relation to Nazanin Zari Radcliffe, who is a dual national. Um, and you can see, so diplomatic uh, protection is dealt with in the prisoner policy guidance at page 104. Uh, and you'll see at 105 uh, sorry at 105.1 uh, 
504, you'll see that diplomatic protection, the bottom of that page, diplomatic protection is the process under international law by which one state pursues a claim against another state on the basis that it has committed an internationally wrongful act against its nationals. So the commission of an internationally wrongful act is the uh, necessary prerequisite for considering whether to impose it. Um, and then um, you'll see again at 105, um, it's extremely rare. This is just under the heading diplomatic protection, a right of the state, the third paragraph. In practice, diplomatic protection is very rare and considered on a case-by-case -case basis, exercised at the discretion of the Foreign Secretary. Thus, this means there's no duty to exercise it, even if the conditions to exercise it are present. The conditions that must be present, present to consider diplomatic protection include the commission of an internationally wrongful act, the exhaustion of local remedies and proof of nationality. And then there is guidance um, on diplomatic protection. You can see that they may take up a claim for a dual national in a third country. Um, HMG will not normally take up the claim of a dual national in their country with other nationality. However, exceptionally, HMG may take up the claim of a dual national against their country or other nationality of other nationality where it has treated them as a British national in the circumstances that gave rise to the injury. So, um, is that, is that this case? Well, my lords, it, I, I can see that that is something that would have to be considered as to whether he had been treated as a British national in this particular case, but that would that. The, the, point for, the point as far as this submission is concerned is that these are all criteria that need to be considered, and one of the criteria is whether there's been an internationally wrongful act against a British national. Yeah. Um, and you can see that, again, in that submission... Uh, it, 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 sorry, in the ministerial submission of September 2021 at 139, that diplomatic protection was one of the options considered. We could ex consider extending diplomatic protection to Kanu, although it is unlikely that he would meet the criteria for consideration as domestic avenues have not yet been exhausted. So that's the reason that's given, it's not the reason that he's not being treated as a, as a British citizen in the, in the Act. Um, but it, I should say, I said at the start that Mr Carney was travelling as a, on a British passport um, uh, when he was uh, transferred and rendered. Um, so diplomatic protection is one of the options. And but it, anywhere local remedies yes. have not been exhausted. Well, that's right, but... Uh, but uh, that also means when it looks as if those remedies are not effective, and we are, so these are these are a part of these are it's part and parcel of the um, assessment that has to be made whether there's been an internationally wrongful act. Except there are other criteria, um, but um, diplomatic protection is one of the options available. It's a simple. Um, I absolutely accept that it is the last option in a series of options. But it is an option, and it is a further reason when someone has been detained in solitary confinement for two years to reach a conclusion on whether they are were the victim of extraordinary rendition or not. So, my lord, calling for release, making a statement about whether someone has been the victim of, a, um, of an internationally wrongful. Of, of an in, a breach of international law, in this case, extraordinary rendition, sanctions, and finally, um, diplomatic protection are all uh, options that are available as escalation when the expressions of concern, the note verbal, the lobbying has not worked. And in my respectful submission, reaching a concluded view, or clear and concluded view, as opposed to a non provisional view, um, is a critical component of properly considering those options and could make a difference. So can I turn now to the grounds of appeal? And the first ground... Ms. Kilroy, just yes. before you do, can I just ask you, it was just talking around this question of the concluded view, um, taking it in stages. 
I assume you accept that initially, at least, the Secretary of State was entitled to form a provisional view. Yes. So, when was it, you say, that he was obliged to come to a concluded view? When it's when the evidence warrants it, warrants it. My no, no, when on your case. Oh, I see. Was he obliged to come to a conclusion? <coughs> and then, obviously, the follow-up question is why? Because this is actually all temporal. So I, I, I just want to try and understand what the what the case is as to when and why the position would have shifted. Well, I mean, the, the first and most obvious answer to that question is there's not a precise date. Um, the, I, of course, accept um, on the appellant's behalf that in the initial days when an, an individual has been detained, a, a process of investigation has to be undertaken to establish the circumstances in which they've been detained and the lawfulness of their treatment. And in order, I also accept, indeed, I assert that in order, in that period of investigation, the respondent is quite right not to simply take no action, but to express concerns based on preliminary views that she is able, he is able to reach on the treatment of that individual. But as the evidential picture develops, Um, then the Secretary of State is, in my respectful submission, obliged to, as soon as it is possible to do so, reach a clearer, non-provisional view. And in this case, what happened was that the Secretary of State was, for many months, requesting explanations by way of note for bow. You can see that from Ms. Broughton's statement as to what had happened to Mr. Carney, the circumstances of his arrest and transfer. Those requests started going out as early as the end of uh, December 2021 and was getting no response. How, how do we know that there was no response? We, we, the interactions were mainly as I understand it, face to face, and then fairly recently, um, a net verbal from Nigeria to UK. Um, we're not told either what the response was in the net verbal, nor what various representatives of Nigeria said well, meetings my, well my lord we are told that there wasn't a response to the questions or allegations that were made about the transfer and I'll have to track down the paragraphs of Ms. Sprouton's statement but there is no dispute as I understand it between the parties that until that, that there has never been uh, and it's not clear to me whether this re most recent note for Val is, is a satisfactory answer to the questions that have been raised. But until, at least until that point, there has never been a satisfactory answer from the respondent, uh, from the Nigerian government, from either the Kenyan government or the, from either the Nigerian or the Kenyan government to the respondent's questions in relation to the circumstances of the transfer. And I will try to, I will make sure you have the paragraph numbers in Ms. Broughton's statement to that effect or in, in the evidence. But that is, our understanding. There has not been an answer. There's not been um, an explanation given. And w one of the important things about the evidence that was below, um, and I haven't taken you through it, but it's um, it's recorded in the judgment, is that the Nigerian government, uh, we, we do have a, an affidavit that was submitted by the Nigerian government in the Nigerian proceedings, which effectively admits um, the uh, unlawful transfer because it um, positively asserts that there was no extradition, there was no need to comply with any extradition treaty according to the Nigerian government because 
uh, Mr. Kano was said to have jumped bail. And it was the Nigerian government's position in that affidavit that they were therefore entitled to go on to Kenyan soil and apprehend him and bring him back. Um, obviously, that is not a position that is consistent with any law. And the Kenyan government had also put in their, uh, in, in their evidence, and again, I can give you um, these references, um, the Kenyan government had also put in their evidence to proceedings in Kenya that, their, that Mr. Kanu had entered the country and was recorded as having entered the country through immigration, um, but there was no record of him having left. Uh, there was no extradition. They were not party to any extradition. That's their case. That's their defence. And what, what is the appeal to the Supreme Court about? Well, my Lord, perhaps it, it's not very long. Um, the appeal to the uh, Supreme Court is at 168 to 192. And it is focused on the jurisdiction issue. given you the um, wrong page number. It's actually, that's the start of Mr. Um, Edumako's statement. It's, it's page 185 of the, of the bundle. Six, the court below relied heavily on the alleged mode of entry, brackets, abduction and extraordinary rendition, and brackets of the respondent from Kenya to Nigeria as a basis to hold that the trial court had lost its jurisdiction to entertain the charge before it, even when it is not in contest, and there is sufficient evidence in the proof of evidence contained in the records of appeal before the court to show that the respondent was standing trial and flouted the orders of the trial court and jumped bail. And then at three... Roman three, the court below erred when it held that the executive arm of the government must not be allowed to benefit from his wrong, brackets, abduction and extraordinary rendition of the respondent, end brackets, when in fact, and by its judgment, the respondent was allowed, that's Mr. Carney, to benefit from the illegality of his di disobeying the orders of the court when he jumped bail. And I should pause there to say that that's why I pointed out the judgment of the Nigerian court in January 2022. He, he left the country, he was on bail, when the Nigerian military raided his home and attempted to kill him, according to the Nigerian court. So that's why he fled. Um, disobeying the orders of the court when he jumped bail and was rewarded with a discharge from the charges pending against him at the trial court, thereby occasioning a miscarriage of justice against the state and the victims of, uh, of the crimes. And, I, you know, the same point is made in a number of different ways. And you can see a similar point made... Uh, at ground three, um, I, I appreciate your cases. All this is nonsense, but but I, at the moment I'm I'm looking at what the grounds of appeal are. Yes, it doesn't seem to me, looking at, at these grounds, that they. They involve an admission of illegal behaviour on the part of the government. Well, my, my lord, there are, they do. They don't challenge the conclusion of the court of appeal that transferring the uh, uh, Mr. Carney from Kenya to Nigeria. in the absence of an extradition, an order for extradition, was a, amounted to an extraordinary rendition. And the court, of, the court of Appeal, in its judgment, went through both domestic law, um, in a local um, human rights law um, of, that was Africa-wide, 
uh, and international. We looked at Bentley, for example, looking at the um, House of Lords decisions, decision in that case. Oh, I, I, I understand that. But uh, so the these ground, are not ground, challenged. Ground, ground three at the bottom yes. of page 187. says the court below occasioned a miscarriage of justice when it held that the rendition of the respondent is unlawful. Yes. Well, my Lord, the, the, that case is about a domestic um, principle. Uh, Patrick Jovens and others is about a, dom a domestic transfer across states in Nigeria, as I understand it. Um, so this it, it's the international law finding. These are all domestic law arguments about the consequences for criminal um, uh, charges of this international law wrong. That's what the, this, this, this appeal is about. And so that is why, and what's more, if your lordships look at the judgment of the Nigerian Court of Appeal, um, and, and it may be worth having a, um, a, a, a brief peruse of some of its key conclusions, the point is that in those proceedings, there was no evidence, proper evidence, <coughs> dealing with the extradition in those particular proceedings. The affidavit I've referred to is in another proceedings. And so what the court found is that there were, there was no um, proper denial of the allegation of extraordinary rendition. Now this is going on appeal to this Supreme Court. It's not, there isn't going to be any further evidence um, in the Supreme Court in relation to the extraordinary rendition. So my Lords, the, the basic point is that the evidential picture is not going to change. The Nigerian courts of various hues, as recorded in the judgment below, have all found that this amounts to an extraordinary rendition. There is, I accept, a, uh, that's why the appeal, uh, there has been a stay on the appeal. There is, I accept, a possibility that the Nigerian court may find, notwithstanding, the Supreme Court may find, notwithstanding this serious breach of international law, that, that Mr. Kanu can go on to be tried for charges that carry with, uh, the death penalty, which is what he's facing. But that, that would not be a reason for the Secretary of State not to uh, reach a concluded view on whether there's been an extraordinary rendition. Indeed, that would be a reason for reaching such a view, because if uh, the, the, as far, uh, from an international law perspective, as the Nigerian court itself found, um, an extraordinary rendition invalidates um, such um, actions and, and would render any impl uh, implementation, even if the respondent accepted it more, more widely, of the death penalty particularly egregiously unlawful. So, my lords, we still come back in my respectful submission to the same point which is that the evidential picture now, two years after Mr. Kanu was detained, um, first detained, after multiple requests for further information from the Nigerian government, after the U United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention has itself expressed a view, that's recorded in the judgment as well, um, has itself expressed a view that Mr. Kano has been the victim of extraordinary rendition. And that's um, in the bundle, supplementary bundle at pages 507 to 523. That's the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. And when the Nigerian courts have reached that view on the evidence before them, and there is no further possibility of any further material emerging on that question of whether he's been extraordinarily rendered because the position is so clear there is no reason for the respondents view to remain provisional I mean in short in colloquial language what is the respondent waiting for what is going what does the respondent expect to emerge as a result of future proceedings which is going to change the position and indeed, that's one of the questions that is raised by ground three. 
There is no proper explanation of what it is that the respondent is waiting for. There isn't going to be an evolution of any evidence on the critical question of whether there was an extraordinary rendition or not. Yes, there is going to be an evolution as to whether the Court of Appeal's conclusion on quashing the criminal charges will be upheld, but not on anything else in my respectful submission. And in any event, it's not necessary, even if there, even if there had been a challenge to the, to the findings of extraordinary rendition as a matter of international law, um, it would not be necessary to wait unless there was a good reason to suspect that something new was going to emerge. The government could have lodged an entirely spurious appeal into the, uh, against the findings. Um, and in those circumstances, it would still be necessary in my submission, not in that position, but it would still be necessary for the Secretary of State to reach a conclusion himself on the material. Why? Because a British citizen has been um, the victim of a serious breach of international law, one of the most serious breaches um, that there can be, which is to be abducted in a foreign country and uh, transferred violently over a border and then charged with a death penalty in circumstances where that foreign government could have sought extradition by lawful means. I mean, what more serious breach could there be of a British citizen's right? He's been kidnapped. Um, and we are now at the position, two years on, where it is necessary, in my respectful submission, and, and, and obliga obligatory, um, given the state of the evidence, for the Secretary of State to come off the fence and reach a conclusion about what has happened. And my Lord, could I now turn to a basic yes. ground one? Because just, in my submission, it's clear... Just, just yes. before you do, my Lord asked the question, well, when? When? And you said, as the evidential picture develops, the Secretary of State is obliged as soon as possible um, to reach a non-provisional view. Presumably, on the basis that the decisions you challenge are dated April and June of 2022, that's the date on which he should have reached his non-provisional view. Well, yes, so... But she at that time. I suppose I can't remember. Yes, that. well, it, there is. There has been a change. Yeah. Um, well, it was the it was the appellant's position um, because what what the appellant did prior to the decision of the fourteenth of April is to send um, the respondent a range of evidence about what had happened, including evidence that he had gathered about flight paths and so on, and all of this is explained in the witness statement of Ms. Marker, the first witness statement put in with the proceedings, um, showing that there had, that the evidence should, uh, demonstrated there had been an extraordinary rendition. In other words, a rendition without any lawful process, a secret flight, and so on. Um, so that was the position at, wi at which um, the appellant brought his initial challenge. But obviously this is an ongoing challenge. So, um, whether or not this court or the court below felt that that point had been reached in April 2023 um, is 22. 22. sorry sorry in April in April 2022 the position has continued to to change and the United Nations Working Group um, uh, report um, uh, the United United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detentions report. Um, emerged in uh, in August, to, uh, sorry, in the late late July, twenty twenty two, and then these judgments um, in um, October, twenty twenty two, and it is the appellant's position that whether or not um, that uh, 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 the, the evidence permitted it in April, which it and that is the um, the appellant's pleaded claim, it certainly does now, and what we see is that notwithstanding those changes that we've, and, and the clarity of the position that we have reached now, the Secretary of State continues to maintain a provisional view. And the reasoning that is given um, appears to be that because 
she has, he has decided not to take action, it's not necessary to reach a conclusive view. And in my respectful submission, that cannot possibly be right. Um, it is the first logical step, and this is where I began, is was the individual a victim of extraordinary rendition? And if so, what steps to take? And my Lord, I think it, it, it is important now to look at the Bassi to see where um, that argument um, comes from. Tab eight. Um, I, I understand the difference between a concluded view and a provisional view. Um, you've at some time, uh, at some points, referred to a concluded view, some to a clear view, yes. sometimes to a formulated view. Yes. Is there any difference between that? I, I, I would have said... Clearly, a provisional view is different from a final view. Yes. F final, straight, concluded. <coughs> but is there any, is formulated view something different? The formulated views we'll see is language that was used in Abassi. What does it mean? The formulated view might be, um, uh, it's too early to say. Well, the formulated view on whether someone has been the victim of it, as we will see, that's the, the context in which the language is used in Abassi. It's a formulated view as to whether someone has been um, uh, subjected to a breach of international law, and if so, it's gravity. That's the way it's put. But, I mean, the, the simple answer to your question is there's not intended to be a difference. Really, what all of those terms are supposed to do is provide an opposition. It's really not a provisional view. It's a, it's a way of saying not a provisional view, not preliminary, but not... you say formulated can't be a provisional view. I say in, in the context in which we look at Abassi, um, formulated can't be a provisional view. Right, let's look at Abassi. Um, so Abassi is at tab 8 uh, in the authorities panel that starts at authorities 252. And my lords, um, without going back to it, um, the case of GCHQ is in the uh, bundle at tab two, and as um, the court explains in Abassi, until that case, it was thought that the exercise of prerogative powers, like the one uh, being exercised in this case, was not amenable to judicial review. But the House of Lords, in that case, um, and this is in the various speeches, but encapsulated in Lord Scarman's speech. 407F, which is in page 99 of the authorities bundle, um, is that the controlling factor in determining whether the exercise of prerogative power is subject to judicial review is not its source, uh, but its subject matter. And since that point, the position has been that if the subject matter or factual application of the power is suitable for review, Prerogative powers are reviewable on the common law grounds of illegality, irrationality, and procedural impropriety. And that's Lord Diplock's speech at 410C to F. Uh, now, because um, Lord Roskell in GCHQ had identified a series of prerogative powers which he thought might not be susceptible to judicial review, and listing the making of treaties, the defence of the realm, the prerogative of mercy and the grant of honours um, as some of the examples. Um, uh, chance, um, the uh, courts have 
naturally seen a series of challenges in which all of these suggestions of, of potential immunity would have been explored and refined. And one of those judgments is, of course, Abbasi. Um, and we can see um, the court applying the GCHQ approach and also another important case of Everett at paragraphs 81 onwards. And it's at 280 of the bundle. Um, and could I just ask you first, before we delve further into it, to, to um, look at paragraph 80 and uh, what the court said there in the sidelined passage is that there are three considerations which have led us to reject the proposition that there is no scope for judicial review of a refusal to, to render diplomatic assistance to a British subject who is suffering violation of a fundamental human right uh, as, a, as the result of the conduct of the authorities of a foreign state. So um, the first, uh, uh, the, the source of all of these, of this jurisdiction um, and expectation is the suffering of a violation of a fundamental human right. And the, the court gives the first consideration, which is the development in the law in GCHQ and um, the doctrine of legitimate expectation. Uh, and then at 85, the court says those um, referring to ex the extracts, which I've just alluded to myself in GCHQ, these extracts indicate the issue of just disability depends not on general principle, but on subject matter and suitability in the particular case. That is illustrated by the subsequent case of, of uh, Everett, um, uh, which concerned a decision not to issue a passport. Um, Lord Justice Taylor summarised the effect of the GCHQ cases, making clear the powers of the court cannot be ousted merely by working the word, invoking the word prerogative. So you can't just raise the flag. Um, and then the courts will look away. Um, and then um, the court showed in that paragraph what I say is a now a consistent theme across the case law. You'll see in the quote from um, 85 that there is a careful examination of whether the issue in fact engages um, the uh, subject matter that is said to be non-justiciable or not. And in that case, the court found that um, the grant or refusal of a passport raises issues which are just as justiciable as, for example, the issues arising in immigration cases. Um, and then the second consideration which led them to conclude that the matter was reviewable is at paragraph 87, and that is the policy capable of giving rise to a legitimate expectation Um, and the court goes through um, various passages in the policy and statements in, um, in, uh, in Parliament 91, and then summarises the um, and at 91 you'll see in the quote from the parliamentary answer from Baroness Scotland at the end in the italicised um, Words, the UK government would also consider making direct representations to third governments on behalf of British citizens where we believe they were in breach of their international obligations. Paragraph 92, taken together, these statements indicate a clear acceptance by the government of a role uh, in relation to protecting the rights of